what I would like to talk about is automatic parallelism, meaning that it should automatically just take your program and distribute it to several machines. Now, as with other kinds of optimization, for example, optimizing compilers, you can do quite a bit automatically, but if you know more about your program or about the application of your program than is apparent from the program text, it always pays to help the optimizer a bit and fiddle it in the way that it gets even more uh, optimized than is possible automatically, and that is certainly also true for parallelism. I mean, it's difficult to see whether certain uh, evaluations will take a long time or whether they will all take the same time. And these decisions dis uh, influence the best way of distributing a computation to several uh, different mathematical kernels. So we'll talk about these aspects. And all of what I'm going to show is part of the shipping Mathematica version 8. Load balancing is concerned with the optimal distribution of many little computations. Now, if they all take the same amount of time, it would be best to ship just one command to each remote kernel and let it work on, in this case, one-eighth of all the examples. Now, on the other hand, if the amount of time these examples take is wildly different, then this would certainly not be the best way to do it. Then the best way is to ship them individually, and as soon as a kernel is finished with one, it will grab the next one until all of them are done. So something simple as a parallel map, I can show you how it can distribute the load onto different uh, kernels. In the first example, I will generate individual jobs for all the f of a, f of b, and so on. And the way to show you how it distributes it is by labeling each evaluation by the kernel number which did the work. And as I have eight of them, and as you can see that it uh, uh, just takes the first eight and then the second eight, each of them individually. Now down here, I do the same thing, but now I say I would like coarsest grained parallelism. And so it takes the first two. You can't see that it does them together, but uh, I will show you another example where you can actually see how it works. It does those two, so it will generate one job for each kernel, each comprised of two evaluations. Now the default is something in between, and here I do 32 of those, so you can see it splits it up into two jobs per kernel, each working on two evaluations. Now that's one of those cho uh, uh, choices. I don't know what kind of application you have, so the default is somewhere in the middle. It uh, avoids gross inefficiency on one hand and still gives you a little bit of load balancing. Now you can see the scheduling in action. The finest grain parallelism generates one job for each individual evaluation. And I can do that by hand by using parallel submit to submit all the individual, in this case, factor integers and uh, generate a table of them and then wait for all of them to finish. And while it works, it will display what is going on. The display vanishes at the end when everything is finished, but I made sure to include one big one. And so you can see uh, some are, most of them have already been received, and there's one stubborn one which takes a lot of time. And this allows you, and now they are all finished, this allows you to see what is going on. You can then very easily identify bottlenecks in this, in this way. Now you can also be a bit more uh, uh, so I kind of obtain the measurements, so you cannot just look at the, the picture uh, as you go along, but you can collect the timing statistics. The way I do this, I define a shared function that will create a callback mm. so that whenever an evaluation is finished, the remote kernel tells the master kernel how long it took, and it collects all those timings. And I'll set up a dynamic display of these, a bar chart of these timings. Now, of course, there's empty, and as I now do, my computation, it will show you the results, in this case the time for each evaluation as it goes along. And so you can see there is one big one, 
but you can see the load balancing is as good as it can be. I mean, it was here lucky to be the second evaluation, and in the meantime, while this was working, everybody else was already finished. Now, if you did a, a coarsest grain parallelization, then you would not get this kind of load balancing. Now, the other extreme is a large number of very small evaluations. So here I did something not exactly trivial, integrate of something. The cosine, the sine p is just here to disturb the input a little bit so that I don't get uh, numerical caching at work. Sometimes the second time you try something, it is instantaneous because mathematics is quite clever and remembering things and I don't want it here. So here in the coarsest grain case, one evaluation for each kernel, there's the, the least amount of communication but if you do it the other way around, then it will, in this case, generate a lot of... Uh, it, this should have been slower than the other one. <laughs> now, I mean, the, the examples are kind of... Um, since we have such a fast machine, I can probably uh, give it a little bit more work uh, to do. Yes, now it takes twice as long and the default is somewhere, should be somewhere in the middle. I mean, somehow everybody's first example is parallel map of sine of x for one million things, which is pointless parallelizing because the kernel can compute the sine much faster than it can send the request to the other kernel. But uh, we have to make sure that this doesn't take too long, otherwise people would be uh, disappointed already in the first example. Now here's an example that is not trivial, which shows you that I don't really have to do anything. This just works with all the uh, defaults. Here is a function that com computes one line in the uh, bifurcation diagram of the logistics map. Uh, does a bin count, uh, logarithmic uh, weighting of the number of points there. And I just do a parallel table and an array plot uh, of these things and you get that bifurcation diagram without having to worry about anything. Obviously this function is used inside the parallel table so it needs to be communicated to the remote kernels so that they know about it but this is all automatic now that's part of this automatic parallelization. Now one area where the automatic parallelization works quite well is when you do independent operations on long lists, and there are many examples uh, of this area, obviously map is an example, select, counting things that satisfy certain properties, uh, listable functions are an example, and inner products are examples of this kind. And there's one underlying primitive parallel operation called parallel combine, that embodies this idea. It takes your long list as input, the function to apply to the list or to a piece of the list, not the individual elements, but to sublists, and how to combine the results received, the partial results. And so for map, this would be a thing to do, and so on. Now the default combiner is joined, so you don't have to specify it, but if in this case, example where you count the results, you don't get lists back, but integers, so you don't join them, you add them up. So you have to help it a little bit here. And uh, the inner product, uh, you need a little bit of uh, uh, trickery to get this to work in this form. So that's another case where I can show off with all these uh, little uh, things that do interesting stuff with a few number of, a uh, small number of, of characters. Now you can see always the same principle, so you take the original function, turn it into a pure function where the long list is uh, the argument here and so on. So this is obviously something that you, we can do automatically. I mean, there is no point in you uh, having to type all of this. So there's a function parallelize that uh, just looks at the unevaluated input, sees ah, its map, so I know what to do with select, count, prime, and so on. So it just works in the same way as before. Uh, and these are all the functions that are handled in this way and allow you to do automatic parallelism. Another interesting case is the iterator. If I want to count the number of primes among the first 10 million integers, 
Well, if you did it naively, you would expand this range into a list of 10 million elements and then divide it into eight pieces and send to the remote kernels. But I can be a bit more clever about this. I can dissect that range symbolically into eight ranges and then send the, com the range commands to the remote kernels because the range commands is 10 characters and not uh, 125,000 or 1.2 uh, million elements. So here is how it works. Uh, you see, it, when I have a table here, it dissects the table. It goes from 1 to 2, then from 3 to 4, 5 to 6, and so on. So it creates sub-table commands and sends those commands to the remote side. That's something you cannot do in a numerical system. I mean, that's really analyzing. It, it analyzes your input. It digs deep into it without evaluating it. sees, ah, there is an iterator. So do it in the most efficient way possible. Another uh, case that comes up is code distribution. If you parallelize something that needs a function that you just defined, well, first let's define it, and then you parallelize a command using that function, well, it just works. But it's not entirely obvious that it should work because it has to collect the definition of that function and send it to each remote kernel. Now, Mathematica can very uh, well a work on its own data structure. So I have, I have functions that allow me to collect my definitions, send them to the remote kernel, and do them over and over again. And this works automatically here. It scans your input, and it finds that the function, and this function has another dependency, and it does that and sends all of those to the remote kernel. It does that only once, so if you don't change the function, it doesn't involve any more com communication. But if you change one of them, then it will be sent again. So it just works. You can do that by hand. Uh, the function is called distribute definitions. You will have to do it by hand if you use functions that you didn't just define interactively here, but that come from some package. It's not possible to, uh, this, this idea doesn't work for everything. I mean, if you have a big package with some complicated function, you cannot just collect the definition and send it to the remote end reading a package can do more than just make definitions. So in this case, uh, you should use remote needs to read the package on all the remote kernels. And so by default, the code distribution works only for symbols in your default context, in the global context for interactive work. So if you write a package using this, you should think about which functions are needed and then issue the appropriate distribute definition uh, commands uh, explicitly. The next step is program analysis. I've shown you how to automatically parallelize individual uh, things like mappings, tables, and so on. But what about the whole program? Well, here's a program that uh, computes a table, assigns it to a variable, then it multiplies all the, what you get as a result is a list of list of numbers. It multiplies all the sublists and then take the maximum of these results. So here I can just wrap parallelize around my whole program and I can show you what it does. Now this command will generate a lot of output. So let me just uh, then scroll up and uh, show you some of the things that it does. Well, the first thing it does is send the parallelize the table. Obviously it does not the assignment here is still on the, the master kernel, so it, it parallelizes this part. And so it sends these sub-tables here from 100 to 101, from 102 to 103, and after it, after it does that, it will get back the results. So here come the results, receiving results from these kernels. And as soon as it has all the results, it then sends the commands to multiply those sublists to the remote kernels gets the results back. Here are all these intermediate results. And then it parallelizes the max function at the end. So here it, it sends all these max uh, things. Some of them are trivial because my example was rather slow, uh, rather small. Uh, but uh, if you do debugging, then you should use small examples. Otherwise, you don't see anything in all these gigabytes of output. But here's an easy way to see what it does behind the scenes.
it has to be a bit clever when it does that. If you do something like parallelize of times of list, well, obviously it cannot evaluate its argument because that's the thing it wants to parallelize and send off to the remote kernels. But still, it has to peek inside and see a uh, list is a variable that whose value is a list. And so it makes sense to parallelize it. If list were something else, it wouldn't try to parallelize it. So it has to peek inside the unevaluated parts. Now, sometimes it cannot be parallelized. If you give it a symbolic function that it doesn't know about, then, well, sorry, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and sometimes it doesn't know what to do, but uh, the way to parallelize a definition is to later on, when the definition is used on the remote kernels, to do it an automatic distribution. So it just says nothing because there's uh, really not, not nothing very wrong with this. By the way, there's nothing wrong with that either. It, it just does it sequentially, so the result will, will be correct, but it notifies you that it could not fulfill your request of parallelizing the input. Well, this is just the beginning. I mean, I can now look at more and more interesting cases that are worthwhile to parallelize, uh, discovering dependencies. I mean, I've talked about independent cases having long lists and applying the same operation to all the elements. What if there are dependencies of elements from earlier results? Uh, there are obviously ways to discover that by symbolic code analysis. Uh, so there's a lot to, uh, to be done uh, to uh, teach parallelize more and more tricks. Distributing large data sets. I mean, you have seen some inefficiencies. I mean, I compute intermediate results, send them back to the master kernel, and that next step, I send the same data as input to the next computation to probably a different kernel. Well, if I can recognize that case, I could leave the data where it is and just do the same computation on the same kernel with that data that's already there. I mean, that's the same thing that you have to do when you do GPU programming. It's very expensive to send the data to the GPU, but once it's there, you can run wild and uh, do, do stuff very quickly over there. Symmetric multiprocessing is another area that uh, I have not uh, covered here. Okay, so, uh, yes, <laughs> if you have any more questions, uh, because we have another talk coming up, so please uh, see me outside the room, and uh, thank you. <laughs>